Okay, so good evening everybody and welcome to Black Cultural Archives Remembering the Mangrove event to commemorate 50 years since the mangrove demonstrations and trial. So uh, as learning manager at BCA, I teach the Mangrove Nine to school children who come to BCA, but only as part of a wider workshop on uprisings. I've never had the opportunity to explore it in as much detail as it deserves. So I'm really looking forward to this evening myself. Some of us may be old enough to recall the event. Some have heard it from our elders and some of you may be learning about it for the first time. And thus, I'm delighted to welcome our very, our very diverse panel, who I've called the A, the A Star panel, because they are archivists, actors, academics, activists. Did I miss anyone? No, I didn't. So that's our A Star panel with, with multiple perspectives on this, on this topic. Um, I hope you will have had a chance to see their, their bios on our website and also on our Eventbrite page. So that the conversation will begin with the importance of the mangrove restaurant as a space of, of, of cultural exchange. Uh, we'll go on to talk about what occurred there that precipitated the demonstrations and arrests, the trial of the mangrove nine as they were styled, and the significance of the case today. Then finally, we'll look at archive material and show you where you can find more information. And this is particularly important for educators who want to incorporate these types of histories into their schemes of work. Uh, and I'll say a word at the end about how you can access our material in our reading rooms at the moment, because we, we, uh, we reopened our building today at a soft launch. So there will be some opportunity for people to visit the reading room and see this material. Then we'll have questions and answers. So as we've got quite a lot to cover, without further ado, I will pass you over to, to Miss Ife Thompson, who is our chair for this evening. Thank you. Hello, good evening, welcome everyone. I would like to firstly thank the BCA for putting on this very much needed event. Um, I'm gonna go straight in with the questions now for our amazing panel. Um, so firstly, we are now celebrating 50 years since the Mangrove Nine. Black activist Winston True, who was part of the Oval Four, writes a beautiful summary of what the Mangrove meant to him in his book called Black for a Cause. On Saturday afternoons, I would go to the Mango restaurant. There were black people everywhere. Black people dressed in panther-starred clothes or in African dashikis. The Mango was a meeting place for black people, a home away from home, the Caribbean in England. It dawned on me that taking up black power meant more than just fighting against racism, discrimination in jobs, education, housing. Equally as important was the fight to rebuild your sense of blackness and selfhood. So my question now is more directed towards Ansel and Anne-Marie. But you know, how important was the space that the mangrove in keeping alive the black cultural revolution? Anyone else that feels um, they're able to answer, please, um, after Ansel and Anne-Marie have um, spoken, please feel free to join in. London was very important in terms of the development of black consciousness and awareness. And I think uh, there were several uh, uh, centers of uh, attention, what we call, I call central combative communal centers in London that acted as a kind of magnet for members of the black community. The mangrove was clearly one of those. It was an iconic place in terms of a restaurant, particularly where you can get uh, Trinidadian food, and, and different aspects of alcohol. So the community coalesced around that because it was within the West London uh, community. In, and when you look at the, 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 the activism, there were similar organizations, similar centers all over the place. The West Indian Student Center in Earl's Court was such a center mainly around student and black political activism. There was all the bookshops, Bogle Overture, Operation Head Start, Sabah, and, and, and bookshops like that where, where people congregated. And then similarly to the mangrove, perhaps as a kind of uh, opposite to the mangrove was Bacayard. Bacayard was a black people information center in, in Portobello Road that acted as a magnet for the community, particularly on the weekends when the, the market was open and we would all lime there with Roden Gordon who was in charge of that particular center. So the mangrove was just one perhaps the most iconic of all the others, 
that brought that kind of magnet to bring us all together. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I agree with Ansel. I think it was a, a key focal point for the community. It was a space that you could go and get food, meet people, meet new people, and it was really cosmopolitan. So you had people from lots of different Caribbean communities, um, also people from other communities coming in. Um, and it was, importantly, it was a site of resources. So I've, I've heard people talk about going in there during the day because they need something in the community um, or they have a concern and they were able to go in and ask people who were there um, questions about what to do. Um, so it was, a, it was a social space and it was also a kind of critical political space um, where people could go to for questions they had and concerns they had, but also a, a space of kind of fun and enjoyment for a lot of people. Thank you for that lovely summary. If anyone else feels like they would like to answer the question, you know, speak now before I move on to the next question. Okay, I'm going to the next question. So a common theme we cannot ignore when looking at the Mangrove 9 case is the racist and discriminatory policing that was rampant in the West. Michael Mansfield QC in his book, Memoirs of a Radical Lawyer, summed up the following. Frank's restaurant, The Mangrove, became the focus of community mobilizing and resistance. The restaurant was constantly targeted by the police. Frank was routinely accused of selling drugs and in a further trial of The Mangrove 6, he was acquitted. In 1989, he was falsely accused of dealing heroin in another raid on The Mangrove. 36 officers testified against Frank, but the jury believed him and he was acquitted. In 1992, Frank won a case against the Home Office for issues that arose during the targeting of the restaurant. He was awarded £50,000, but this was of little comfort as the mangrove had been closed down while he was awaiting trial. From this summary, we can see that the mangrove was systematically targeted and shut down. This technique of targeting black spaces to effectively neutralise or in some cases destroy them is not unique to the UK. Globally, even in America, we see the use of such tactics to stifle black power movements. And this was effectively seen um, with the New York Panther 21 trial with the Black Panthers. Um, you know, why do you guys think that the manga was targeted by the police in this manner? So I'm not sure if we're supposed to put our hands up or just talk. Just go ahead, anyone, anyone who feels led to answer, please go ahead. Um, well, I think one of the reasons that um, racism exists um, is in order to exploit and control people. And therefore, racist policing exists, or policing exists in the way in which it does, in order to better discipline um, the subjugated populations, whether it be lower income people, racialized minorities, or other people, right, to discipline them. And so where the, where, where the states can see, where the government can see that people, um, that these oppressed groups, this, in this case, black people, are, are not effectively being disciplined, are not being a disciplined workforce, and are being wayward, are being, dis, are being dissenters, are being radicals, um, are, are, are um, fermenting resistance, then force them to attempt to control that space. And so we see that through the raids, through the false accusations of drug selling, through all of the different types of problems that the mangrove had imposed upon its doorstep and, it, and inside of its walls um, by the police during this period. Thank you for that summary, Adam. Um, did anyone else want to answer why they think the mangrove was targeted by the police in this manner? I, I know I spoke already, but, but I think the context of what was happening in London at the time is important because there was a kind of, a, it was a time when we were really infused by activism and engagement and involvement and things were happening all around us, even though there were sort of geographical locations, so that West London and North London and, and uh, Hackney, all these sort of thick areas had a kind of unique um, geographical uh, circumference around them not the kind of unity that we had in those days, but each of those spaces were important. And I think what has got to, we got to remember is what was happening in England and London at the time. For the Trinidad, Trinidadian community, it was the year 
when we had this uh, George William University uprising by black students against the, the university for its racism. It was a year when there was a, the, the, the uh, army mutiny and the black power revolution in Trinidad. So all of that influenced the thinking and the engagement. And there was a concern by the British state about how in, that impacted on the development of the black community. It's, it's also happening in, in, um, in the USA in terms of the black power movement. Um, and and that, that, is, that was, for example, the, the gagging of Bobby Seale uh, at his trial was an I iconic image that we grasp and we carry forward and it resonated with what was happening in the courtrooms of, of the Old Bailey. So I think, and I guess we need to understand all the contextual things that really fuel that sense of anger, that sense of wishing to get uh, proper justice and the, w the willingness to take action. Um, could I chip in? Yes, please do. Yeah, um, well, just to say, I, I'm Leroy Logan, a, a retired police officer, and I know from um, that era that the SUS law was uh, a systemic approach to keep people oppressed and by the constant stopping and searching and arresting of people. So that was London wide, and, and the Met has historically been using the, um, the SUS law um, far greater than any other town uh, or city or other constabulary. So as a result of that, I believe because it was uh, the cultural norms and values of the Met and how they use the SUS law in an institutionalist way, institutionally racist way, it was quite clear that any organization that was doing for self was going to be seen as a threat. So if it wasn't in, um, Westbourne Park area of Notting Hill or Hackney or Lambeth, they will always be on the focus of police officers because it was all part of their systemic approach to minority groups and a form of oppression. So it was a consequence because it was met wide. I think Can I briefly? And, and Sorry. And we do recognize certain uh, specific police officers during that period that were very notorious as far as the black community was concerned in West London. Sergeant Ridgewell was the, is the one and Savage in Brixton, two key officers who everybody, every black person knew what they were up to and what they did in relation to the black community. And I think also the state using the police, as you said, Leroy, was to try and control activism because there was an association between black activism and criminality. And it's that association that was built as a police action to create the opportunity to dismantle the black community and, and tackle it. So that is why Tony Suarez was tackled. That is why the Oval Four was tackled. That is why Roy Sauer was tackled. That is why Michael X was tackled. That was the, the strategy of the state to begin to deal by any means Possible. Whether it's deportation, whether it's arrests, whether it's, it's, it's um, dismantling the black community resistance and its, its communal centers. And, and you'll know that if you put your head above the parapet, you're going to be on someone's target. It's as simple as that. I think Vicky wanted to go next. Was it Vicky that was wanting to speak? Yeah, if you don't mind. Um, so just kind of related to some of those points. So um, I work at the National Archives, so we have state records very much reflecting a lot of these themes. Um, so I was going to firstly just pick up on uh, Ansel's first point about uh, the fear of um, kind of overseas context um, and the American movement, uh, because we've got lots of records around the Foreign Office, of what's happening overseas. And I think that context is incredibly important um, to the policing that's happening uh, in London at the time. Um, and then absolutely what we can see through state records as well is the, even prior to, you know, the marches on Portnall Port Road, um, is the observations on the Nine and other members, key members of the community at the time, um, exactly what kind of Leroy was also saying about people putting their head above the parapet um, so there's secret police observations essentially um, so I think all of that context is key to why the mangrove specifically was seen as such a 
a radical space to be policed and the fear of, um, I guess, political organising. Thank you for sharing that, Vicky. I think it's really important to get that global understanding of what was going on behind the scenes and also to understand, you know, particularly internationally, that when um, Ansel mentioned what was going on in Trinidad and in America and how there was a global sense of activism that was quite rife. And I think it was it's really interesting that Ansel mentioned that, you know, people knew the officers by a name, you know, Sergeant Ridgewell. I mean, we don't have that sort of culture now where we specifically know of um, officers by name because they're so notorious and I think that speaks testament to how bad things were at the time. So I'm going to move on now, we'll be looking a bit more about the actual trial itself and the legacy of the trial. Um, so it'll be nice just for the people attending to know a bit more about, you know, who the Mango Nine were and, you know, what did the trial stand for, particularly for the Black community, but also, you know, in, in Britain in general, what did that trial mean? It might be good to hear from maybe Ansel to his perspective of particularly, you know, who the Mango of Nine were um, and, you know, what they were on trial for and what, what their trial really meant. I hope I don't get all the names wrong. That's the issue with it, that, because memory is a problem. But uh, uh, there, there were nine key people. Uh, most of them, or at least the majority of them, were very active uh, within the community. Darkus Howe, uh, Althea Lecon, Roden Gordon and, and, and some of the others who were the, the key characters and who were um, well-known individuals within West London area. I mean, it was, again, uh, an opportunity to engage with people because of the, 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 the march that happened in August, on the 9th of August in 1970, when it is claimed that about 100 to 150 people um, marched on, on, on the streets and created a disturbance. And, and there was this kind of a, a opportunity to use that as a pretext to, to stifle the voices and stifle people. And I think it was significant because the trial itself had a number of features that was very iconic and was very uh, novel. For a start, it was a recognition by the judge that there was in institutional racism on both sides, he said, but specifically for us in, in relation to the police. The opportunity, I think, that we took uh, Althea certainly, Althea Lacan certainly, to defend herself, not rely on a lawyer. And the tactics she used in the court was quite remarkable because those of you who know Althea, she's very, very, but probably a typical Trini, Darkus and Althea were orators. They can speak fluently and with style and with rhetoric. And they did so in the court to the, to the extent that caused embarrassments among the witnesses and, and, and the prosecution witnesses and the police officers. So that direct intervention and, and, and thirdly, the opportunity to choose jurors, to challenge jurors on the basis of whether or not they may be racist or they may not like black people or they may not have visited the mangrove restaurant. And, and they did that. And for me, one of the memories, obviously, is a colleague of, uh, that I, I, I see as an important individual was Ian McDonnell, the radical uh, lawyer, white lawyer, that defended some of the guys. And I think that was quite significant because we owe as a community a lot to him. Yeah, I mean, I've been recently reading a lot about um, Ian McDonald and, and the work that he'd done, particularly in the Race Today anthology and, you know, very, very amazing powerhouse and even the way he reacted to the community and very much carried the idea of movement lawyering, you know, lawyering with the community, ensuring the community's voices were heard and centred and actually um, ensuring that their uh, way or the way they wanted to run the trial was how he was going to do it. He wouldn't kind of take it from a traditional legal point of view, but actually drawing on strength from the defendants, I think that was very unique and, you know, he, he's a wonderful powerhouse who sadly passed away last year. Um, so the next question I want to um, direct these questions to is Anne-Marie and possibly Adam as well. Uh, and it's what was you, the unique factors around this trial and its procedures? I know that Ansel's mentioned it a little bit, but it'll be good if Anne-Marie goes into a bit more detail about the unique factors. Sure. Um, so a, a really important kind of key factor was that the defendants in the Mandra of Nine trial called for an all black jury. So they, um, they, Darkest Howe in particular, um, who was uh, representing himself, as Ansel mentioned, um, and others 
called, based on legal precedent dating back to the Magna Carta, um, the idea that you should be represented by a jury of your peers. And so they said that this should be an all black jury um, as in particular, they saw themselves as in a way putting the state on trial um, for racism. They really took the opportunity of the courtroom to change the narrative um, and re-project it in a way that really spoke to the, the repeated harassment of black people in the community by police. So they called for an all black jury. In the end, um, the jury was 10 men, eight white, two black. So they didn't end up getting that all black jury, but even that kind of set the tone from the very beginning of the trial um, of what it was that they were trying to accomplish. Um, and then a, a mangrove defense committee was set up. Um, Tony uh, Mohip, who was Trinidadian lawyer involved in the Black People's Information Center. Um, and this mangrove defense committee becomes a model for a number of the trials that happen um, in the early 1970s. Um, and that was about kind of building community resources. So making sure that people got the defense that they needed, but also critically that um, word got out to the community of what was happening in the courtroom. Because the Old Bailey, of course, was this space that for so long was um, a very white space um, and the highest court in the land. And this, the fact that the trial was taking place there meant that there were members of the Black Panther movement every day taking really detailed notes um, and then producing that, reproducing that and sending it out into the community so that if you weren't at the trial, you could find out day to day over those 10 weeks what was happening. Um, and then the last thing I'd say is that um, both Darkest Howe and Althea LaCointe, who represented themselves, um, got police to admit um, to certain things. So um, Darkest got uh, a ch deputy chief superintendent to admit that this was a protest against police harassment. He, you know, they were trying to say that this was um, a violent protest, that this was, um, or uh, that, that it wasn't a protest with much, which, with much, much purpose. Um, and then Althea LaCoyne asked one of the police officers to define black power. Um, and he gave a definition that suggested it was about um, black people taking control of the country, um, which kind of spoke to all of the fears of black power that existed um, in, the in, in British society at this point, white fears of black power. So they really put people kind of on their toes in terms of admitting the truth, um, or at least acknowledging that they didn't understand really what black power was and, and, and having to acknowledge police harassment in the courtroom was, was really important. Thank you for that. And I think it would be really good if Adam came in here talking a bit about the legacy of the case, you know, how it influenced particularly um, equality legislation. Um, and I think the point that Anne-Marie just mentioned around the idea of why it's fair of black power and how that influenced legislation going forward. It'd be good to kind of um, hear a bit about that, Adam. Um, I'm not sure how much I can comment on how it's affected legislation going forward, but I think it certainly had a huge impact in the way in which black community struggle understood the, the, the extent to which it could make interventions, not just on the streets um, and in our communities and through protests and through those types of um, action, but also making really important interventions into some of the most powerful institutions in the country. So making sure, making that trial something which caught national headlines, which was, um, which, which, which showed that showed the police for the racist for the racists that they were, was fundamentally important because it was still linked to a community struggle. Like as was already mentioned, we had members of the Black Panther movements writing notes. You had the you had the local newspaper, the local black newspapers um, uh, covering the trial. You have um, community pickets and all of these types of things outside the courtroom. And I think that was really important for demonstrating that, like the United States and the high profile trial. High, high profile trials of the civil rights movements and, and that kind of thing. We can have that, those, that same kind of um, movement style legal campaigns here in Britain as well, which um, can be high profile, can gain national headlines, can have everybody talking and can be won as well. And I think that's what's one of the reasons why the mangrove was so powerful at the time. And I think it's also one of the reasons why we continue to remember it today. Thank you for sharing that. Um, the, the power of the community was really shown for that trial. Um, another 
question which I think would be good to kind of hear the panel's views about is, you know, how similar was the type of um, the type of um, the way that they ran the, the trial, how type, how similar was it to cases in America? So like um, you had demos at Bobby Seale's release and that you had the case of the New York 21. How similar was the modes of like activism around the case, of the Mangrove Nine to the American style of activism around um, particularly black power struggles and, and black movements alike? It may be good for Anne Marie to come in maybe on this to give a bit of perspective. Particularly. Sure, yeah, I wasn't sure yeah. if Anthony was coming in, I couldn't tell. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that um, it's interesting. There was a, there, the, the, the Black Panthers and um, other, the, the, there were three Black Panthers and, and six other people um, who are all community activists um, who were part of the Mangrove Nine and uh, everyone was influenced by but also influencing um, these kind of transnational discussions around police harassment, um, injustice, um, and community change and community building. And so um, certainly people involved in that um, in the Mangrove Nine and others had already been protesting um, on behalf of people like Bobby Seale um, in the United States. Um, and Conversely, um, the trial um, gained news in African American newspapers in the U.S. So this was, um, it was, it was a kind of circular conversation, um, but also a circular sense of solidarity that was really about the dia the African diaspora, um, that grew and um, kind of made these these trials into real strong, really strong focal points um, for people in the community. It was a way to kind of come together and understand that you know, my own experience um, was not that different than someone else's in the United States, for example. Um, so I think that the trial spoke to one another quite a lot. I think there were also very similar um, cases and trials in the UK, England, and particularly that, that benefited from some of the strategies of the Mangrove Nine, or also indicated or examples of how um, Black activism under the Black Power Movement in the United, United Kingdom um, manifested itself. Um, there's a trial as of the Oval Four, who were members of, uh, of the organization I was involved with, which is the Black Liberation Front, and the Persimbas, four young men um, who were uh, accused of stealing from a lady's handbag. And the end of that was obviously a complete exoneration many, many years afterwards. Then there's the issues around um, Tony Suarez, uh, in 1973, who was uh, again taken to court for reprinting uh, an article from the Black Panther Party uh, newsletter. And there is other people like that and other cases that, uh, that in a sense was evidence or evidential evidence, evidence of how the state was responding to activism and to, to the building of community defense systems. And one of those community defense things was the, the creation of a legal element within most organizations. So legal aid um, and, and the, the coming together of lawyers, the black lawyers, uh, whether they were at Fund Hill Road in, in, in Hansen, um offices or whether we're in West London, um, in the black community law centers, all of these was a, a gra gradual engaging of uh, professionals, black lawyers coming together to participate in the struggle. Thank you. It's really interesting that you mentioned that because I just recently set up a, a project called the Black Protest Legal. We were able to get a lot of lawyers, particularly black and brown lawyers, to go down to the current Black Matter marches and to show solidarity as legal observers and offer their support pro bono to any Black Matter activists um, arrested. So I think it's so important to have those of us that are with a legal field supporting the community from the ground up and taking part in what I like to call and what is very much known in America movement lawyering, so lawyering for the people. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next section now, which is particularly looking at the future and reforms, particularly around policing. Um, so the type of policing that led to the case of the Mangrove Nine um, that is allowed to thrive without impunity or redress is 
you know, racist policing. Um, so my question is kind of directed to Leroy. You know, what were some of your calls against incompetent and racist policing in the 80s? Well, I mean, <laughs> again, before the Police and Criminal Evidence Act that came into action in 1994, you still had a sus law in the, um, in the 80s. And, um, and of course, sorry, 18, sorry, 1984. Mm -hmm. So up till 1984 you had the sus law and then after that the police and criminal evidence act but even though you had a more accountable um legislation you still had the cultural norms and values that again would be very economical with collating um reasonable grounds to stop people and it did allow very corrupt and racist officers and relatively incompetent officers to thrive. And I suppose that's where the Lawrence case lay bare because 1993, Stephen Lawrence is killed by a group of racist thugs. And within days, those officers knew who had done it and community members were saying exactly what had happened. And because those officers were corrupt, racist, and relatively incompetent, and very aligned to the suspect's families, those, of the, those people were arrested, but nothing really done. Uh, and in fact, I think they spent less than two hours in police custody, uh, you know, in, to answer um, a heinous crime. And as we know, we, till this day, there's only two out of the five suspects that's been um, put before the court and uh, convicted. And we know, even up to last week, we have a commissioner, Cressetta Dick, who said that um, the case is being shelved. Now that in, in itself, for me, is a massive kick in the gut for the Lawrence family, the wider black community. And it shows that the, the, the Met is not learning from its experience and it's not really understanding the importance of trust and confidence because if they did they wouldn't employ this type of draconian enforcement tactics in the first place from sus law and even how it played itself out in the current police and criminal evidence act so we we had a, a, a real issue until the mcpherson inquiry and the subsequent recommendations some of you might know I was one of the three black police association members that gave evidence to say that the police was institutionally racist. And we took ownership of those recommendations, primarily linked with the Stephen Lawrence steering group that was chaired by Jack Straw and Neville and Dorian Lawrence used to sit on that steering group to hold the police service to account. And that's the thing. If you don't have independent oversight, don't expect my colleagues to be critical on themselves because they're not going to measure it and if it's not measured it's not done period so when that stephen lawrence steering group from 1999 to about 2009 there was real movement real um accountability that we'd never seen before um and that was in the middle of my my career in the met and i really thought we are in a opportunity to really hold those rogue officers to account, to deal with the systemic failures, to really tie down conscious bias, not just unconscious bias, conscious bias, and how it plays out in the street. But unfortunately, since um, the 2010 government and their austerity and the disconnect with um, communities because of safer, um, safer neighbor teams being decimated, safer schools officers being decimated, there's been a disconnect. And we now got police officers using these punitive enforcement tactics that they use handcuffs before they do a stop and account or stop and search. And I haven't seen that since pre-McPherson. So in a lot of ways, we're back to where we were 20 years ago. Um, I truly believe we're in a pre-McPherson era and the leadership from the commissioner right across is not holding officers to account. In fact, I think they're emboldening them to think they're unaccountable. And um, 
untouchable because they, they can carry on with these tactics and no one's sanctioning them. There's not the supervision and leadership on the street. So we've got a perfect storm in closing. Police officers are acting in this very draconian way. We haven't got their independent oversight and the political masters let them get away with it. So you've got a Home Secretary, Priti Patel, allows them to get on with it. We've even got Prime Minister, we let them go and get on with it. So don't be surprised that the same sort of tactics like the mangrove and other um, cultural hubs might resurrect. But I think they're only being able to hold back because community activism. And I would like to think the Black Lives Matter movement is a way of really holding back, I believe, the type of police force and not a police service. And I hope that movement will continue. Thank you, Leroy. Some interesting points raised there. Um, and I think one point which resonated with me um, quite a lot was the point where you made about Chrisenda Dick. Um, you know, she's recently just said that it's not fit to call the Met Police or the police um, institutionally racist anymore. And I think it's very bold of her to try and even have the, to think she has the authority to um, take away a name that she didn't even give to the police force. The police force got that name because of their behavior and it's the community and um, the community alone that can take away that name. And as far as what we're seeing, there isn't um, um, policing done by consent in this country and you know that we have to look as far as the statistics you know that just showing just how bad black people are being treated by the police force um in the uk so i think it's really important that you have you made mention of the fact of the lack of accountability even on a leadership level um which is also prevalent and we've, we've seen so much um so the same police racism and violence is what led to the blm insurgents this may um what do you think about the concept of defunding the police and the means of police accountability and, and community redress? And I would address that first to Adam and then Leroy and anyone else who's, who would like to come in. Um, I don't think the campaign to defund the police is about police accountability. Um, I think it, what it is, is a, it's a recognition that policing hasn't done what it claims that it does it claims it's supposed to do. Policing claims that it makes our community safer, that it reduces harm within our society. But over the last 30 or 40 years, we've seen massive increases in our prison population. It's almost doubled over the last 30 or, over the last 30 or 40 years. Black and other minority ethnic people make up a quarter of our prison population. We incarcerate black people in this country at the same rate as African-Americans are incarcerated in the United States. We Right. The prison system is, is burgeoning in this country, yet there's been no in significant improvement in community safety. And so what defunding the police is about isn't saying that we need more accountability for the police. It's saying we need to think about alternatives to how we can improve our community, community safety. So it argues for better mental health resources for our young people, better support for people who've experienced domestic violence or child abuse, better, better, better funded youth services, uh, secure council housing, um, uh, uh, Free, free education um, and grants for people from low income families in further and higher education. All of these types of things that can help um, the most vulnerable young people in our society before they come into contact with the criminal justice system, rather than the inequalities and injustices that exist already within our society effectively being imprisoned away and putting those problems behind bars for two, three or four years and exacerbating them in the process. Thank you. And um, Leo, anyone else would like to come in? Yeah, um, I, I totally agree with, with Adam. I, I think we just need to go uh, further upstream and say, why was the police um, brought into being in 1829 by Sir Robert Peel? It was actually to protect those that have against the have-nots. And we as people of colour are seen as the have-nots and have to be held back and controlled and oppressed. Um, as you know, um, the Windrush generation was testament of that and the colour bars before even a police officer could join in the late 60s. So, you know, we have to understand how it's set up. And as a result of that, we are seeing the defunding issue being banded around. But I, I think we have to understand that police can actually create problems than they actually solve if they're not directed in appropriate way 
and understand their powers. So for me, the public health approach to policing is key so that they're not being called on their own to deal with mental health issues or drug related issues or even safeguarding issues. Because sometimes just the officers turning up in uniform can actually trigger things and create an adversarial stance. So there should be a triage approach in dealing with these things. So certain force areas um, around the country actually have uh, paramedics and approved social workers and even doctors patrolling with officers so that they respond to these certain calls. So that means you realign funding from the police to those specialist areas because police officers are not specialized to do with these softer skilled issues which we have seen play out in terrible ways. So I would like to think the public health approach that's been used um, to some extent um, in London, but the, the issue is with all of those models, public health or otherwise, is the cornerstone of that process, is trust and confidence. If you don't have trust and confidence, you have a major flaw in police legitimacy. And it's the legitimacy of police has been an issue for decades. So before they can really introduce the public health approach, they need to build back trust. So that means the day-to-day -day heavy, heavy handed policing has to stop. It needs to be, uh, there has to be a narrative to, to, of intent that they are going to ensure that the right sort of ethical leadership from the top, right across the organization to the streets, so the officers are held to account. And you then have to have, as I said, independent oversight to know how they're using their funds. And if it's not being done properly, why not? So that means you have to have a real review of the police crime commissioners, because a lot of them are just rubber stamping what chief constables are doing. In London, we have the Mayor's Office of Police and Crime. How often do you hear Mopac saying anything about what the commissioner is saying about institutional racism when she's not skilled to do that? And it, it was a home affairs select committee is the only ones who can actually say if they're institutionally racist or not. And that's being reviewed as we speak. So we need to have accountability and transparency to ensure that policing is fit for purpose and we build back that trust and as well as realign the funding to ensure police officers are not being called to deal with certain issues where they create uh, uh, inflamed things. And I'll close by saying this, police officers, their default position is they see someone that they th think is, is a threat, invariably in involving their color, especially black men, and they go into enforcement mode. They, and especially our young men, mid fifth, uh, under 17, they should not be seen as prisoners or potential prisoners. They should be seen as patients. And, and I really believe that the um, lack of safeguarding that officers are showing with these constant stop and search with handcuffs, et cetera, is actually adding to the pain of a lot of young people with adverse childhood experiences, toxic stress, wider community trauma. And this is where officers are creating that perfect storm I talk about which can play itself out in so many ways. And until we get um, independent oversight and the politicians doing what they're supposed to do and hold the police to account, we'll be talking about this in the next 10, 20, maybe 50 years. Um, could I quickly just say one thing about Cresta de Dick? Um, I think it's important to remember that a lot of people had heard of Cresta de Dick before she became Met Commissioner. And the reason they'd heard of her was because she was in charge of the operation that killed John Charles de Menezes, a Brazilian plumber who the police who killed him in Stockwell Police Station said they thought was a Middle Eastern terrorist because, quote, he had Mongolian eyes. This kind of racial profiling wasn't uh, punished. She wasn't held to account. She was given an OBE following the killing of John Charles de Menezes. His promoted. family never got justice, and then she was promoted to Met Commissioner. So it's not just the problem that we have an institutionally racist police force. We have a government which, which celebrates and, and rewards racist violence. And not only racist violence, racist killings. And so I think we have to think about this problem of racist policing beyond the institution 
of the police itself because it goes all the way to the government if we see that this is the kind of tactics and um, the kind of violent racism which is rewarded by our government. Thank you for sharing that. If anyone else wants to add on, please let me know. I'm going to move on to the next question, if not. Yeah, I just wanted to add, as um, experience, experiencing getting stopped and searched myself quite a few times, a lot in my youth, being young, 22, growing up in urban London, I feel like there's a sense of, there's a disconnection in terms of identifying with the youth when it comes to the police. So just living in the area I live in, I'll get stopped and searched on that basis. And I just feel like there's, the police don't necessarily, the police I, I get, I encounter, don't necessarily understand what it means to be a young black male living in London. They already have their blueprint of what it's meant to be, but they don't necessarily understand the, the experience that that comes with. So that already is, already, is always going to cause a conflict and there's always going to be tension. That's how I feel about it. Though. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's um, really important that you brought that element of, of lived experience in because I watched a program on Channel 4, it was called um, The School That Tried to End Racism, and there was a young boy who was accosted by a security guard who accused him of stealing and um, picked him out only. And he, I think the, the security guard was like, oh, I know people that look like you always come in here and steal something like along those lines and you know even when that little boy was telling the story on channel four and that was obviously a, a few months after that happened he was crying because he's a child and i think all too often we have a situation where our young people are adultified and their idea of them being children is overlooked and they're very much criminalized and funneled into the criminal system so i think it's really important to look at um the effects holistically but even looking at the individual and how that affects the individual because sometimes that get left left out of the conversation so i think that was very powerful thank you for sharing that so i want to move on to the next question now um it says as elders and activists and young people um what reflections do you have on the current climate of black lives matter and what are your hopes for black liberation and black internationalism in the future and this is um at everyone and so alexia jerry Or shall I chip in? Yeah, yeah, you can go ahead as well. Yeah. Um, well, in all honesty, um, I, I've been working with uh, young people since um, I set up the uh, Voyage Youth Charity in 2000 because we realised that we have to educate our young people in the way they have to navigate the system. So we set up a leadership programme since 2001 it's now equivalent to a BTEC level two, and they actually get UCAS points um, after finish that 100 hour uh, modular program. Because we, we realize that they have to know their rights and responsibilities, and also know how they develop positive peer to peer men mentoring so that they actually assist each other to stand up for themselves in an appropriate way and holding officers to account, not in a blase way, but to say, you know, treat the officers with respect and hopefully that's, that's um, reciprocated. And of course, the, the fact that they actually can use a camera and asking for someone to monitor the, the, the stop and search or whatever the encounter is with, with, with someone filming. So that, that's the sort of things that, you know, they have to have operational savvy you know they have to have real skills to understand how they can do for self and also change their environment and not just become a victim of it now that's e easy said than done but I, th I think that the fact that a lot of our young people want that help and and also deal with the issues around identity so they have to know their history and in fact you know we in our program, we look at iconic cases, even including what happened in, in the mangrove, because they need to know how they have to learn from the past and really help young, their own young people. So for me, education is the key. We need to help all of our communities as well to know their rights and, and responsibility. And uh, I, I would like to think that um, 
the wide education of the public. Because, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, I think, is so well timed. And, you know, from what George Floyd um, had to experience being killed in that horrible way by an officer, which was obviously just torturing him to death. And so I'd like to think that all of the things that is starting to crescendo at the same time, you know, you're starting to see, um, you know, the, the small acts series that starts with a mangrove nine. It's really resonating so much, so well. So I'd like to think that is starting to do it. And we have to start changing the narrative. The narrative is really important that we own that narrative and we start to speak our story. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons why I wrote my book, Closing Ranks, because I want people to understand what's happening in the police. What's happening, you know, why would police act in this way? I mean, they're not, in, they're not sensitive to themselves, much less to the black community, because I saw that for 30 years. So we need to own that narrative and do for self and collaborate in a way that we start to assist one another and coordinate in a way that we haven't done for a long time. Because I must commend in the 60s and 70s, there were a lot more coordinated than we are now. So I'd like to think we learn from that and really build that critical mass of people that work to really challenge the organization in the courts like they did uh, with the Mangrove Nine and also ensure that we build our own places to speak truth to power. That for me is critical. Um, could I just say also in light of what Leroy was just articulating in terms of the 60s and the 70s being a lot more coordinating and organized, I definitely feel like that is what's missing in today's generation growing up in the environment that I'm in. The black unity is not on the forefront of your average young black male's mind, in my, in my opinion. We're not thinking about unity until racism shows its ugly face at our front door. That's when we seem to mobilize and whatnot. But even when we do mobilize, it tends to be very brief. It's not, there's not longevity in the struggle. So it will, like in light of the Black Lives Matter right now, when it happened in May, there was a lot of social media presence. There was a lot of, you know, the, the people, people were rising up, there was an uprise. But even just seeing it now, if you're gonna focus on social media, it's slowly fading away, slowly fading away. Not to take away from the organizations that are doing work behind closed doors, but in terms of the mass, of the of the the youth it's not when we, we have an experience what our elders experience so we're not going to necessarily have the same spirit and mentality that they had in terms of unity because we don't have a mangrove right me anyways I, I i feel like it's a it's very finding black communities where we can organize politically is scarce like i don't know where to go and i can sit with other like-minded individuals my age and speak about what we're going to do for the betterment of our people i, I don't know where to go so i just feel like the it's, we're missing we're missing that element and I think a part of his experience so that leads me to my next point about education and learning our history so that we can at least get some insight of who we are and I feel like parents have a very crucial responsibility of doing that because the schools we're going to are not doing that I didn't know about the mangrove nine the race regulations that I didn't even know UK had um, black panthers until I had to go and do the research myself after I finished secondary after I finished college they're not going to teach us these things so I feel like the elders have a very, have a, a big responsibility, same as the, tr the youth as well. We need to be inclined to want to learn about ourselves and our parents need to ingrain it into us from young. Um, I just want to add on to that as well. Um, I feel like in my experience of school, um, there was a massive separation between the black students and the white students. And white students were seen as the smart ones who took higher science, higher math, and higher with all the subjects where the black students would take foundation and not get a chance to like use their smartness and uh, get higher than a five or six or stuff. They stopped us from reaching our full potential because <laughs> who knows why, but yeah, this this like, and that kind of made some black students because I knew for me, I felt dumb or whatever. And that's because it was, they was putting that into us. They were saying that you're not smart enough to reach higher than a five, you're not smart enough to actually make it and anything and I feel like that's like making us not powerful and then with that only learn about um 
other people's history but not our own history also have an impact on us as well because like we don't feel empowered like with the mangrove nine um it's like once you reach such more about it you find out more about yourself and find out that you can be empowered you can be smart you can do all these stuff if you want to but if schools don't teach you that kids are not going to learn that they can change things they they have power they can create a massive change to the future and i feel like that education is really important even as much as we, we're, supposed to, we're supposed to get this stuff from our parents our parents never got taught this so that's why i feel like they start doing this from a young age and actually teach us more black history it should be 50 50. you can teach what you want to teach but also add in black history and not just the slavery or the bad in black history just the good and what we have accomplished and what we have solved and what we had changed to make this world a better place. Thank you. Uh, does Adam want to come in there? Like he wants us to come in? Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I guess, um, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely echo some of the things that have been said already, but we certainly still have a problem in our education system of uh, discrimination against black students. I mean, when I was at school, it was not dissimilar. I was into the f foundation for a lot of GCSEs and put into low, uh, lower sets for when it came to streaming and those types of things. And I think that was more down to discrimination than my intellectual ca um, capacity or capability. But I, and but I also think it's important for us to look back at history and understand our history and realize that educational projects have in our communities have always had to be grassroots we've always had to have black supplementary schools and grassroots movements in order to understand black black political movements black political thoughts and black political histories and i think what's important about those um uh, black supplementary schools of the past past was that they were connected to a movement it wasn't simply people necessarily learning from their family or their friends or that happened a great deal it was also black organizations which were connected to the to organizations like the black panther movement like the, the campaign to the mangrove or race today or anything like that so i think that's really important as well but i think the second thing that's really important and i think i think i would like to see for i guess was black liberation and black internationalism um, are precisely those two things how do we reconnect the struggles that we're engaged in the anti-racism that we're engaged in in a way that speaks to black internationalism because today everyone loves to use a black power hashtag nike is doing a black power hashtag amazon are checking their privilege um, um, you know uh, what's his name the head of the labor party is taking the knee right everyone's doing this checking their privilege thing right um and i think what's important to remember is that um you know people can check their privilege all day long or or um do some unconscious bias training every morning before they brush their teeth or anything like that but i don't think it's going to end the kind of racism that we're facing when we look at the um the black power movements of previous decades like those involved in the mangrove they were intrinsically linked with anti-colonial and anti-capitalist struggles all over the world if we read the pages of race today when we went um who were involved who were involved in a lot of these uprisings who were writing about trade unions in india were the uprisings in trinidad or guyana or jamaica um, engaged in links of solidarity with the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. All of these different types of struggles understood that um, uh, black liberation has to be a collective project. It can't be about um, personal notoriety or changing you and, and how you feel about yourself or how you treat your peers or your friends or your family or anything like that. It has to be a structural change. It has to be a fundamentally systemic change. Some people might say, and I think many of the mangrove would, it has to be a revolutionary change. And I think understanding that kind of history, that kind of international history, that kind of liberatory history, I think is fundamental to bolstering the movements that have taken place this summer. And that's what I think I would like to see our movements become in the in the years thank you i mean um adam i don't know if it's a chat but it's been on fire since you started speaking so people are really liking your um your summaries and your discussions that you've just brought to the to the um panel just now so i'm going to move on to the next question um what factors other than policing um may have led to the demise of spaces like the mangrove i know jerry's spoken about um the fact that we don't have as much spaces like that and there's you know it's very difficult for young people to locate a specific space where they can go to to engage in the sort of activism um do you think that we've lost such a historic cultural specific space um like this in the uk forever or you know at this moment in time it may be good well, to I, get I, I like to say that oh yeah leroy go ahead 
Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I would say since austerity started in 2010 um, in its real form, it has legitimized the way in which um, equity and cohesion and all of the issues around race and equality has been um, kicked into touch because the issues that, that were on the agenda when I was chair of the Black strategic levels. Now, oh, the police, it was also around the Crown Prosecution Service and various other uh, organizations, institutional organizations. So that's, for me, it, it's really critical to try and get those changes done. Um, can you still hear me? I'm, everything's frozen a bit. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. So, so as I said, austerity has been a form of legitimizing these key issues that we need to uh, address. And so things have gone backwards and it's emboldened so many people. And dare I say it, the B word Brexit as again, because you know, hate crime has gone through the roof um, since Brexit and it does impact on how officers think they're un 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 unaccountable and untouchable. So I believe the institutional racism is not just in the police, it's also in local authorities. So in the name of um, austerity, they say, well, we'll cut down on um, social services, on youth services facilities. And again, people of color are on the receiving end of that because they're already, um, um, for want of a better word, ghettoized in urban deprived areas. And they don't have those um, proper housing as they should or proper areas to, to assist themselves. So, you know, that, that's where I, I truly believe the austerity has been the, th the evil thread through cutting down resources for communities. And this is what COVID has laid bare of all the in inequalities and injustices that even impacts on the health system. So we, we have got to really understand what we're going through and how we need to do for self to assist, you know, at the next generation, because I, 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 I am really concerned about what my grandchildren are going to be inheriting. So we need to work, you know, we, as um, John Lewis said, that we've got to do some good trouble. We really need to work together in a way that we haven't in a long time. And I would like to think that the movement um, that we're going through at the moment is not just a moment and we move on. We've got to keep it going. And that's why someone actually asked me a question, why am I so disheartened? I'm not, I've got fire in my belly and a real resolve that I want to do as much as I can. That's why I'm not chilling somewhere in Africa or the Caribbean on a beach. I'm still in the hood, still in grassroots. We need to work at that level to assist our people to know time is of the essence and we got to do for self. Thank you, Leroy. So I'm just going to quickly move on to Ansel now, just so I can get his perspective on, you know, why we lost spaces like this um, called the demise of spaces like the mangrove? I, I think to, to a great extent, um, there were a number of complex factors that influenced that kind of development. I know it's very easy for people of my generation to glorify what we did in the past, but I was very much um, energized by the Black Lives Matter movement and the fact that young people were taking control. Um, I think it's important also that we, we, we be aware that we should not always see ourselves as victims. We have to be our own liberators. We have to come together to bring things together. Wherever a mangrove, dis mangrove disappears, there should be another one appearing. Uh, we should be able to look at ways in which what I call central communal combative institutions and centers. We need to have those so that we have 
grounding in our community, opportunity for people come together. And most important, to the extent to which, as we all progress in society, uh, we open those doors for others and we initiate change wherever we are. So for me, uh, Leroy was always a, an icon to look up to because of what he's done in the police force. So I expect change to happen and I expect all others like him, Robin Williams and, and, and others to make that initial change wherever we are. So we need to create another mangrove. Mm. I like that, thank you so much. Absolutely. So I'm going to um, move on to the next question now, which is directed at Alicia and Jerry. Um, you know, what do you, obviously, um, Ants was really nicely summed up the need for us to, you know, create another mangrove. Um, so, you know, would you say that where young people organise now is mostly online and in physical spaces? You know, what do you think this sort of activism has been replaced with from then going forward? So I think as all too often we tend to glorify the past but sometimes we get to reflect on what's going on now so in terms of how young people organize now you know how do you see that um, and how do you see yourself in that next do you want to go first um yeah um I'll go. Um, I feel like, yeah, well, we're living in a digital era right, era right now. So it's a lot different to how it would be um, during our forefathers' day. And yeah, there is, a, there is a social media presence, but I'm worried about the, the roots of it. I don't, it, it, a lot of it, I feel like it's superficial. Forgive me, I don't remember who was mentioning it, but there was a lot of, um, like how Nike and all these other brands are doing a lot of, Black Lives Matter stuff like that, but it's, there's no structure behind it. There's no necessarily like where where is it coming from? Is it all face value? Is it all just to be politically correct, be with the trend to make it seem like they're actually fighting for us? And I feel like that's what's happening a lot on social media. That's the issue with social media. If you're actually doing it in person with the people, there's going to be a lot more value to it, and you you're actually going to be able to mobilize with one another. And I definitely feel like that's what's missing. Also, like I was mentioning before. Um, the drive to be better for the race is not there anymore in terms of a majority for the youth. And I, I'm young, I'm only 22, but I worry what, how it's going to be for my grandkids. If this is, if this is the ambience right now in the, world, in the world that we're living in, it's, it's very, yeah, it's concerning. And um, I kind of feel like we're going, we're going backwards. As bad as it seemed back in the 60s, I feel like there's this false narrative that things have gotten better for black people because we're getting more things now we're becoming more materialistic and that is more so serving as distractions because now we're looking elsewhere rather than what we're the wealth that we can build for the people we're going to bring into the world so now i just feel like there is a lot of distractions and that's social media is definitely another perpetrator of that so i definitely feel like if we are going to be doing anything if we're going to be taking action it needs to be in person you need to get intellectuals, activists, people who generally have the best of interests for the race and come together and actually make something happen, turn these words into action. Thank you for that. Um, Alicia, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, um, I feel like social media can be a good platform to share um, information, but then I feel like, especially young people, they need to realize that information can be twisted and turned depending on where you're getting it from. And that's just like social media can be a positive but a negative and anything. So that like, I feel like there should be certain certain accounts which people can go on to, which they can they know is reliable and the information is um correct. Well, because now I feel like there's a mix of accounts and if, um and there's a mix of accounts now and anything. And I feel like like Javi said, in person is more better because you can teach each other in person. While on social media is is kind of different in person, you can see how passionate someone is. While and in texting, you don't really know what's going on. Anything. While in um, um in person, you have like um you have the powerpoints, you have things you can do things together. You can come come up with projects. Your idea comes out more um if you're in a space where you feel there's um everyone's in the right headspace. Everyone wants the same thing. While social media things get twisted and turned. 
and you don't know what's true and what's false. And that's really a big thing for the youngest today as with um, the Black Lives Matter trend. It was a big thing and even until it's just like, words is getting mixed around. People was only doing it to just seem cool or so they can get ratings by their friends or just for different, um, to be popular, but they wasn't really doing it because they know what's going on. Thank you, um, Alexia and Joey, I'm talking about how the activism is becoming quite performative, particularly on social media um, and how in terms of genuine long lasting change or interest in the struggle, it's not there. Um, so thank you for your insight on that. Um, and leading on to that, um, the SPID Theatre Company works with young people on social housing estates to create accessible arts and performance as a means of strengthening local communities. The company is staging a play about the mangrove and Alicia and Jerry have been chosen as SPID's youth ambassadors. Um, so I just wanted to know Alexia and Jerry, you know, what you've learned from this research, you know, how relevant is it to the lives of um, young people today um, and when will it be performed and how can we access it? Well, we've been conducting research on three major historical um, points, which was the Mangrove Nine, the Race Relations Act, and the uh, Black British Panthers. And we've basically been conducting interviews with people who would have knowledge of these different areas, and even having interviews with the Mangrove Nine, some of the Mangrove Nine's children. So just gaining a lot of information from authentic resources, which we're then going to transform into a radio play which will be available, which will be coming, which will be performed on Saturday, the 17th of October. So note that down. And it's going to be on now, Zoom. Now how can we access it? Uh, it's going to be on Zoom. So it's still TBA right now, but okay. it's, well, how, how, where the play, the space it will be happening is going to be on Zoom. But we'll let you know the details and whatnot. Thank and um, yeah, in terms of your question about how young people can learn from, I feel like these projects are extremely vital because these are the these are the the mediums that are happening right now in this day where youth can actually learn. We can never stop doing these type of things because if we stop doing these things before we know, we've forgotten where we're coming from. So these these projects, whether big or small, are yeah monumental for our our people and you know what we can learn from and where we're coming from as well and the, the triumphant history that we've had. Mangrove Nine was a significant triumph that we won it shows that we can beat them at their own game so things like this are just very important thank you and i think it's really important to diversify the means in which people can access information and i think using visual forms to ensure people can learn about historical important events is you know one of the ways of doing that and also as you as a young person being able to deliver that sort of content young people that may not um, have engaged with that because they know you will engage with it and it's a way of definitely ensuring that information is shared in the community in a way that's accessible to everyone so I think that's very powerful um, and it's a way of keeping tradition alive. Um, Alex do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, just that is very inspiring learning these um, histories of um, what happened in the past is it inspires me to create my own like books and to um, work on projects at schools like during Black History Month to like put to make like an area which black students can come out and talk to each other one to one to me or one to one to other people and have a space because I feel like in most schools they don't there's not really a space so by doing this project it inspired me to come up more ideas to do with school workplace or different areas where I can use this history to empower people inspire people motivate people Thank you. So this sums up the end of our discussion. Um, Vicky's got a short presentation, um, which she's going to do, and then we'll take some of the questions from the actual um, attendees um, and put it to the panel. So I'm going to hand over to Vicky now. Thank you. Um, sorry, it's a bit of a change to do a, a presentation, as it were, but basically I just want to show some of the images uh, that we have at the National Archives and some of the archive items. Um, so I'm just going to try and share my screen, so bear with me. Um, hopefully you can see that okay. Um, so I just want to briefly um, look at what we hold at the National Archives, because essentially the National Archives is the official archive and publisher for the UK government and England and Wales. So very fundamentally, <coughs> sorry, 
our collection represents the interests and belief of government at various points over the last 1,000 years and essentially 11 million records we hold. So there is huge kind of potential in terms of the records that talk about particularly black British history, um, but also overseas colonial kind of history, um, lots of complex problematic histories. Um, but I think when we're talking about things like education, um, what you see when you look at the National Archives is that there's no reason not to talk about this history and this material because it is so evident. We have lived experience as uh, the panel have shown today, but also archive items and the state perspective. Um, so essentially, uh, why do we predominantly hold this material about black British civil rights and civil rights struggles? Um, echoing a lot of what's been said today is it's because of the kind of backlash from the state um, and the kind of policing of individuals such as the Mangrove Nine. Um, so while the records fall into Metropolitan Police records, Home Office, Assizes records, essentially it's because of this uh, policing and state response that there's kind of a wealth of material now. Um, and I just want to kind of delve into like very, very briefly what this can kind of help us do now. Um, so personally, I didn't know about the Mangrove Nine actually until I had a visit to the Black Cultural Archives um, and by chance was shown a newspaper uh, and on the front was um, a kind of headline around the Mangrove Nine campaigns and I went back to the National Archives and I had a look. Um, other people have explored this material so I haven't discovered it but for me it was quite a surprise as someone who talks about diversity in our collections um, that we had such visual images, such kind of powerful images. And to my uh, knowledge, they weren't widely known outside of the academic community. Um, so I think, you know, using visual images, we can really engage people in this history. Um, the kind of material that we have relating to the Mangrove Nine is possibly what you might expect from what I've said about the, the state perspective and the policing. So we have uh, things like witness statements, um, Surprisingly enough, they're mainly from the police perspective uh, or kind of witnesses on the street, but not generally the marchers. Um, and we also have these very kind of emotive photos, um, which I think tell us a lot about policing at the time. And there's also things like maps as well. So it's, it's very much because they're trying to figure out at the time who are the, in, in their kind of words, the key leaders of the march, who were the people that kind of conspired to pull it together. Um, and it seems that they're very much looking out for certain people. Um, and the photos, as well as being kind of um, powerful and showing us kind of the um, the slogans that were used and the um, even the kind of outfits, which were often it's inspired by the um, American Black Panther movement and things like that. They also show us on a really logistical level how heavily policed the march was. Um, the, the march to save the mangrove. So um, this kind of illustrates, I think, um, the fundamental point that I believe there were kind of 200 police officers compared to 150 uh, marchers. And you can see that it's it's massively over policed. And I believe there were more kind of police on standby as well. Um, but equally, um, I think there's unexpected sides to a government archive and what we can learn about the mangrove case. So uh, on screen, I've got one document that's handwritten. Uh, that is actually uh, Frank Critlow's original complaint to the Race Relations Board. Um, and essentially, uh, it's handwritten and it's him complaining about the raids on the mangrove um, and articulating why he feels that they're being targeted and how it's unlawful. Unlawful. Uh, so he explicitly says in his own words, in his own handwriting, I know it is because I'm a black citizen of Britain that I am discriminated against. Um, so this articulation in someone's own words of the discrimination they're facing is, is something we possibly wouldn't associate with state records and the government archive, but you can actually get a lot of perspectives you wouldn't possibly imagine. There's also uh, the typed kind of um, letter was actually an open letter written by, um, again, we've already had them mentioned, but the Action Group for the Defence of the Mangrove. Um, and so essentially, this is kind of a statement of intent by the protesters. This is why we're doing what we're doing. And this is why we believe it's the right kind of course of action. Um, 
And so that was sent into the Home Office, uh, the Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, who was the leader of the opposition, uh, the High Commissioners of Jamaica, Trinidad, Guyana, Barbados. Um, so it was widely spread and it articulated their message. You know, um, Frank had written into the Race Relations Board. He tried the, the kind of official government means. Um, so they, they turned to the streets and they marched, um, but with these very articulate uh, kind of um, political statements. Um, and again, it's very powerful just to read now. Um, so a line from it, we the black people of London have called this demonstration in protest against constant police harassment, which has been carried out against us um, and which has been condemned by the legal system. Um, so it's, it's very articulate. It shows that they're using so many different means and that's what we can see from our records. Equally, I think we've discussed a little bit the kind of community ephemera, but you know, normally I would associate material like the um, the community kind of pamphlets as being in an archive more like the Black Cultural Archives. Um, but actually, again, we have various items because of the way that they were seized or used as evidence. Um, so the picketing outside the Old, old Bailey, um, you know, use these kind of uh, publications like the one that says Battle for Freedom at the Old Bailey that has eight of the nine um, depicted on the front. Uh, and essentially they were they were kind of thought to maybe be in contempt of court because they were sharing literature outside the court um, and therefore um, that becomes kind of uh, part of our records and similarly um, there's an amazing archive item uh, Black Panther Movement what we stand for that details a lot of the kind of uh, community standpoint of the Black Panthers what they're fighting for at the time um, and while the state seems to see them as aggressors um, this this pamphlet really outlines that a lot of the concerns are very basic the housing welfare education poverty uh, international solidarity uh, with movements in other countries and and that's i think really uh, interesting as well um so i'm really pleased that education has come up a lot as a topic because clearly there is the material to discuss there are the stories and important um messages to to share from things like the mangrove trials um, but we did work with uh, BCA back in 2015 um, and we brought our collections around uh, the mangrove and these protests together uh, and essentially uh, me and my colleague at the time Rowena uh, worked to bring these archive items to new audiences uh, bring together the records at BCA and our own I think I believe for kind of for the first time unite the the kind of the state perspective in the community um, and then we did um, spoken word workshops and creative workshops. Um, so Roger Robinson uh, was our facilitator and we used spoken word and discussion to really kind of delve into the topicality of these records. Um, so I think it was open to people under 25 at the time. So we're really trying to target people that um, maybe hadn't heard of some of this history, but we felt really should have. Um, and I feel like a lot of this is kind of absolutely BCA's mission statement. Um, but it's something we really want to do more of at the National Archives, we're a lot less known for. Um, so it was really, really powerful to do that. Um, and we cre created a lot of discussion uh, facilitated by Roger and the, uh, the documents. Um, so one individual said, I will never look at my streets in the same way again. Uh, so actually lots of the discussion, while it was about race and racism, um, stop and search and things like that, actually for a lot of the people who were there, what they really picked up on was things more like uh, gentrification and and the changes in their neighbourhoods that they were identifying. Um, and they turned that into kind of um, spoken word um, pieces, which are uh, on the National Archives website. And I can always share. Um, sorry, I'll go back to that. But um, essentially, I think the National Archives records around the Mangrove Nine are hugely important and maybe show things that you wouldn't expect. So there's more community perspectives. Um, as unpleasant as it is to look at, it tells us a lot about the police kind of state at the time. Um, and you can certainly see lots of kind of problematic elements to the policing. Um, so it gives us a lot of that material to look at. Um, and it also, I think, really shows us the multiple ways that the Mangrove Nine fought for just justice. So through the, the Race Relations Board, through the systems that were already there, through marching on the streets and then absolutely as we've discussed the kind of um, the courtroom and the kind of show trial that they created and um, yeah maybe there's something to learn from 
the kind of multiple methods in the kind of um, fight against uh, racism now and the, the Black Lives Matter struggles. Finally, I just wanted to show um, an image. So we had uh, the privilege of having um, a couple of members of the Mangrove Nine come to the archives. So Althea uh, Lequant and also Barbara Beast, who's not pictured. Um, and we also had Eddie Lequant, uh, um, Althea's partner, and also Knowlton Cricklow, the, the son of um, Frank, in at the archives and looking through the material, um, which was pretty incredible. Um, but also I think shows how, how by sharing kind of personal experiences, looking at archive material from the state, but also the Black Cultural Archives, we can create kind of a really robust full picture and make sure that this kind of, these amazing documents and stories get out to future generations and hopefully inspire people more. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Has that stopped sharing? It has. Ife, are you still with us? Oh, I'm not sure. Ife, I was talking, but I was on mute. Oh, and okay. you couldn't see me. Carry on. Um, thank you for that wonderful presentation, Vicky. Um, I was just asking, you know, following on from that, just as director to Ansel, you know, you've donated your personal archive to the Black Cultural Archives. Could you tell us a bit more about what your collection encompasses and how it can be used for educators? And I think that's a really good topic because we talk a lot about education to keep a legacy of Black history alive. So I think it would be nice to get your perspective around that. I think the key thing really was it's very much an eclectic um, collection, things dumped into a, a, a chest of documents and things that I had, which I donated to the Black Cultural Archive. So there was no structure, there was no intent on my part to select and collect things, but all the things that were I were involved in as a young person in, in, in London, all the documentations, all the letters from people were do donated. And I think that's a, a very important thing because each and every one of us has a narrative and we need to be able to capture that narrative to ensure that our history, our struggle, our intervention is archived and is open and relevant to people. Not just the people who are celebrities or, or, or I mean, footballers or whatever, but each and each one of us, our parents or grandparents, if they came here, um, they have a story to tell. They have a, a resistance they have taken and that needs to be captured. And that's all my, that's, that's all I have. And I think it's important to also catalog some of the things, uh, iconic type of developments that has happened. Uh, so during my time uh, in terms of activism, I was a member of the Black Liberation Front, which is uh, the kind of antithesis to the Black Panther Party um, and slightly different uh, from them in terms of ideology and politics. So we had a different approach. So there's also issues in, in terms of education. Um, I had established the, the, the first Black full-time supplementary school in Brixton. So there are elements around that in terms of that history, um, as well as the opportunity to learn a little more of some of the publications we did because I was also the editor of Grassroots newspaper for many years under the pseudonym of Ade Kimati. So um, not many, many people know that, but uh, that's one of the things we did as a struggle. We each all had different names, um, but ironically, one of the things that came out of that is the opportunity that exists where there were clearly individuals in all of these organizations who were feeding the police with information. Um, there, were, there, were, there, were, there was people embedded in our organization who were doing exactly that. And in the trial of uh, Tony Suarez, when I gave evidence in, in, in the Old Bailey, the prosecutor had a file on me and clearly at the top of the file, it had Ansel Wong, AK, also known as Adi Kimati. So the police, security services, everybody knew. So we were playing at revolution, not realizing. So some of those documents are there in my um, collection and it, it, it needs to be put into a kind of historical context. And I think uh, BCA needs to get somebody to start doing that so that each of those documents has history and a narrative behind it. Thank 
you very much for sharing that. I think it's really powerful and it's reminding me particularly what we've read about um, the Black Panther movement in America and COINTELPRO and how police intelligence was so prevalent. I also recently watched a documentary on Netflix particularly called Who Killed Malcolm X and it talked about a lot about how much police informants they had around Malcolm X in the movement. You know, you would have thought that they were actually part of the movement but actually they were informants so we see all too often um, our movements are constantly surveilled um, and infiltrated. Um, National um, Archives, oh my internet's gone a bit funny, the National Archives will be doing a program on the manga of Nine for Key Stage, the Key Stage 4 so definitely check that out with um, Hannah and also my organisation Blam UK hosts projects for young people and black history as well so anyone wants any young people to learn about black history there are spaces that are doing this ensuring that the narrative is continued so definitely check out um, the Nat National Archives and also Blam UK. I'm going to move on to the next part of today's session which is um, we're going to be taking some questions and comments from a few people. Um, I know people are asking questions as we went along, um, so I'm just going to pick a few, pick a few out at the moment. Steps that can be taken for the various issues discussed today. Anyone want to lead on that? Some of the action steps that can be taken. I mean, I've said one about education just now. Um, if anyone else has got anything else to add in, please um, let us know. While they're thinking, we can go to some of the more um, straightforward questions. There's one for Leroy. Um, it says, the McPherson report spoke about the canteen culture of the police. Can you expand a bit on how casual racism is expressed and experienced within the police force in terms of the attitude towards the black community a resistance to any type of challenge? Well, um, casual racism was um, rampant when I joined in 1983. Um, the N-word, the W-word was used regularly, not only in the canteen, but in quite formal briefings, um, it, which was a real struggle for me when I was in my early years. But as I grew in, in up the ranks and in confidence, um, before we set up the Black Police Association, I used to challenge that. And um, you can imagine I was public enemy number one for even daring to uh, um, speak up against those things. And it wasn't just about uh, what they would say to me, but it's what they would say in reference to the other um, black personnel or even members of the black community. So, you know, it's a massive issue for, for me. And it stopped to some extent or reduced. It, it went underground, that casual racism. Again, there was that independent oversight to hold chief constables and the commissioner to account that that was not allowed and people would be sanctioned or even lose their job. And as I said, we saw progress because that um, accountability and transparency was there. Um, unfortunately, as I said, since austerity and Brexit, we have seen a total shift back to their default. Now, they might not be using the same um, form of words or it's, it's a lot more microaggressions now. It's not so much what they do to you, it's what they withdraw from you, as well as chipping away with those insidious remarks. And of course, the systemic failures are still there internally in terms of recruitment, retention and progression, and the lack of, and the fact that officers are five be subject to um, discipline, investigation, as a more than their white counterparts. I myself was investigated after McPherson because we, um, again, was putting our head above a parapet in challenging the organization. Uh, fortunately, all of that didn't go to court, but, you know, we realized in stepping up and being holding people to account, we would be um, in someone, someone's scope. Um, but like everything, if you don't keep the pressure on, if you don't measure uh, improvements, and, and you're, you're gonna see things going back, and, and that, that's why, you know, it might not be 
the ca canteen culture as it was, but it's that progression, that insidious nature of racism and the systemic failures that are being laid bare more and more and the heavy handed policing that we see on our streets on a daily basis is something that, uh, as I said, has dr driven me to write uh, my account about my autobiography, uh, Closing Ranks, because I think people need to know, even if they want to join the police, they need to know what they're going into. You know, it's like going into a blazing house. You have to make sure that you're well prepared to withstand the heat. So that's what the narrative is really important. And, and that's, you know, I concur with Ansel. We need to write the narrative so that people know what is going on. So even if they want to respond to the calling of policing, they're prepared. And more importantly, how they can work with the staff association like the Black Police Association, which I helped to create 25 years ago, how it can be um, a force for good, not only internally, but for the black community. So, you know, work is still there. We still need to work hard to change not only the canteen culture, but the attitudes. Because Martin Luther King said, we can bring as much legislation as you want, but can you legislate the mind? And it's the legislation of the mind of those officers has to be dealt with and sustainably once and for all. Thank you for that. Um, another question, maybe this is more directed to Anne-Marie, um, and it says, you know, when looking at the trial, there was a lot of working class people on the jury. Um, do you think that had a general effect on the outcome of the case for the Mangrove Nine? Thanks. Um, I think it may have contributed, but to be honest, um, I don't know for sure. And I wouldn't want to say one way or the other. Um, I think that certain things did contribute. And one was kind of the public um, outcry and response that grew throughout the trial, thanks to the work of people in the community to continually kind of keep the community informed of what was happening. So um, there was never really a moment when this, the trial for the 10 weeks that it lasted wasn't in the headlines. Um, and that was due to the work of the community, um, community members and, and people being really interested. And so this kind of um, culture of the sort of celebrity trial um, in the sense of it becoming a, a focal point in the media, I think did make a difference. Um, in the eventual outcome, as well as the, the testimony um, and the, the fact that members of the community were defending themselves in the trial. I think that made a really big difference um, in the kinds of questions that were asked and the discussion um, that people were forced to have on the stand and the things that were said in the court would not have been the same if members of the community hadn't chosen to represent themselves in the case. Hey, are you muted again? Okay, well, until um, and it says that um, in the 1670s, um, for instance, the Sheffield Division. Can you hear me? Oh, hello? I can hear you now. I couldn't hello? Maybe Was everyone... I cut out? Yeah, start oh, again. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, so I've got two questions I'm going to just merge just in terms of time's sake but it's directed at Anne-Marie and Ansel but you know anyone else that feels led to answer please you know join in um, and it's saying that um, was, how are you aware of the black power activist groups outside of London during the 1670s and um, the person asked the question so they know, the, they know there was a shuffled division of the British Black Panthers thanks to photos by Neil Kenlock but information on such groups has been very scarce during um, their research attempts um, and also another person has asked a question about the term politically black um, and how um, at the moment the person forces as a, a sense of erasure going forward um, because the term pussy black is not really used at the moment. Um, so I just want to kind of talk about, about that. Um, so if you could both kind of talk on that, that would be helpful. Yes, I think there were lots of other organizations outside London. Obviously, a lot of the things are very London centric, but we, we 
part of our political motivation was to be able to embrace a united uh, United Kingdom wide uh, movement. So we used to go to, um, for example, with the Pan African movement, we had meetings in different cities, Birmingham, Manchester, London, and it would, it would um, flick from the, um, week, month to month, where we would have those meetings. There was a, a, an attempt to bring about unity. There was an attempt to, to broaden the outlook. So there were many organizations uh, uh, that represented black liberation, black power, that met sometimes very informally and sometimes very formally in meetings that we attended. Um, during that time, there was also an issue around the, the, the concept of black um, in the sense that it became uh, a unifying word that embraced anybody of color. Um, so that the notion of black and Asian um, unity was very much a dominant force. So the Black Indian Workers Association and Joshi and other people like that were part and parcel of that black movement that, that, that we, we are part of. So we saw ourselves as united. Um, it was not just an Afrocentric uh, movement, it was a movement based on people as victims of discrimination and injustice. Thank you. Um, Anu, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, just to add, um, I am I'm in the process of finishing up a book, and so I was actually pulling up a file um, in which there are many cities around the country where there was black power activity um, uh, in the early 1970s. Um, and um, some interesting places to look to find out more about that. One is actually in the newspapers of the Black Panther movement. So they were trying to trace and chart what was going on in places like Wolverhampton, um, in Manchester, in Liverpool, in Cardiff. There was Black Power activity. Um, and, um, and then also the, the Ahmed Iqbal Allah uh, Research Center, which is in Manchester, is doing some interesting work around um, activity, black power activity there. So um, I would say that, that that's definitely something that um, researcher activists are really interested in and starting to think a lot more about and would like to collaborate on with people in the community um, outside London because it's definitely a part of the story that hasn't yet um, really become as, as, as known perhaps as, as, as the events in London, but there was definitely black power activity going on in a whole lot of other cities, Nottingham. Um, so there's um, more to discuss and I'm happy to share resources um, with anybody who's interested. And I think the thing, the thing is sometimes it's not an organization, but it was individuals, activists, individual activists working on, on the basis of their belief and sometimes most of them coming down to London for meetings or coming together. So a lot of our Liverpool activists, a lot of activists, as you say, in Wolverhampton, Bristol, uh, and so on, would, would be engaged and they would consider themselves as black power activists and would, would not have a, an organization behind them as such. Great, thank you for that. I think that's gonna be the last question from me and I'm gonna hand it back to thank you for hi I think sorry we've lost you if I or I have I don't know if, if it's just me if I okay I think she was saying that she's handing it, it back to me now, that's the, the crux of it. Um, I'm, um, it's just been such a wonderful panel. I wanted to sincerely thank all of you for, for being so generous with your time and with your knowledge. What I'd like to suggest, because I see a lot of questions are coming in now, I'd like to suggest, if that's okay, if we can uh, forward the questions on to you, if you would have time to to answer them and then we can return those answers directly. I don't want to just leave it and, and, and not answer them because there's so many really fascinating questions there. So thank you all for your time. And I want to thank all of you who, who've, who've tuned in this evening and are listening. And those of you who've made donations because it, it's making a real difference to Black Cultural Archives and it enables us to continue putting on uh, public events like this. So thank you. Um, for, please do send comments and suggestions to info at bcaheritage.org.uk that's info at bcaheritage.org.uk and if you've got any requests for our reading room if you want to access any of the material 
you can also email archives at the same email address, archives at bcaheritage.org.uk. So thank you, Ife, for, for your wonderful chairing. And thank you, Ansel, Anne-Marie, Vicky, Leroy, Alexia, Jerry, and uh, Adam has gone, but, but thanks to Adam as well. And good night, everybody.